Welcome back. You're watching our continuing coverage here from Davos 2023. I'm Shireen Bhan, and it is my pleasure to welcome Best Managing Director Sadia on the program. Sadia, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining Thank us here uh, in Davos in person after a really long time. Very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, Sathya, I, I want to talk about the global risk report that came out just before the annual meeting. Uh, you talk about a fragile, volatile landscape and a potential new era of poly crises. Um, given where we find ourselves today, and the fact is that you're hoping that world leaders will come together to try and ensure that we don't end up seeing a more fragmented world, how hopeful do you really feel? And do you think that we're moving towards that era of a poly crisis? So let's talk about the risks first. We actually are in the midst of a poly crisis. We asked um, all of the experts that we were serving to look across three time frames. What's happening today, the key risks that are unfolding today, what might be happening two years out, and then what might happen 10 years out. Right now, energy crisis, food crisis, top of the list. Two years out, still the cost of living, that's the combination of these things, in addition to natural disasters, and then all the way out in 10 years, there's the risk that we don't manage to mitigate climate change and we don't manage to adapt. So all of these things are playing out at the same time, but right now we're in the midst of a poly crisis and you know, resilience is so low that if there were to be yet another shock in this particular situation, um, it might be very unmanageable. And that's exactly what leaders are here to talk about. How do we shore up resilience today? And how do we start investing again for the future rather than having this short-term crisis mindset? Mm. But is there enough confidence at this point in time, both to build on resilience as well as future investments? So I think there's um, definitely areas for optimism. Let's take a look at what's happened when it comes to energy over the last mm. year. On the one hand, yes, of course, we're in the midst of an energy crisis. But what that has created is much more momentum, investment, incentives, where governments are essentially trying to put in place the green energy transition much faster than what they were planning before. And that is already leading to a lowering of prices in a relatively short period of time when it comes to greener energy. Now, of course, we're not out of the woods yet, and there's much more to be done, and this transition will take time, and there will be people who will be severely disadvantaged, but we're towards a positive direction. So there are areas where things are changing, but it's not enough. And I think this is where that innovation investment mindset has to come back. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of uh, further global cooperation, China being represented here by the Vice Premier, the hope and the expectation is that with the change in policy as far as reopening is concerned, the zero COVID policy being put on the back burner, so to speak, at this point in time, uh, some pullback even as far as tech regulations are concerned, real estate market regulations are concerned, that there is a change um, uh, underway. How are you reading what's happening in China at this point in time and what's the expectation from here on? So cooperation is essential and I think these can only be somewhat positive signals. At the same time, I think the jury is out as to how quickly China rebounds. Um, we have our chief economist outlook that's coming out today and the, you know they have a mixed picture of what's going to be happening and how quickly China is going to be bouncing back. On the one hand, yes, of course, opening up again will be extremely important for the Chinese economy and by consequence for the rest of the world's economy. On the other hand, there are obviously health impacts of how quickly this reopening is happening and that may need to lead to some kind of a lag in the recovery. So I think the picture is mixed, but overall, again, the trajectory is more positive than it has been before. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about India because India has been resilient, especially over the last 12 months. What's the outlook uh, on India from here on? So I think the, India is one of the few areas where the world can look to to find a source of optimism, investment, innovation, energy, and the right kinds of future investment when it comes to human capital as well. I think the broad scale digital investment and the broad scale investment in education and skills will be critical for India's future growth and becoming you know, the largest country in the world this year. It's critical that that happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, one of the issues that I know that you've been focused on as well is, of course, the widening gender gap. And things haven't gotten better on that front. If anything, they've gotten worse. Uh, in terms of global cooperation, uh, to move that agenda forward, do you have any sense of optimism at all today? So look, there's been a backsliding over the last three years, and you know, you and I have spoken about this before. It's very clear that gender equality has taken a hit, like many other aspects of human development. The people that were the most disadvantaged 
became more disadvantaged over the course of these last three years. And that includes women, that includes girls, and there are specific hotspots around the world. Here in Davos, we're actually going to bring together leaders to look at how gender equality is core to the macroeconomic recovery. We have to look at this at a critical economic issue, but we also have to look at this as a leadership issue. Mm. Right? If we want to change how leaders take decisions, what types of decisions they take, diversity becomes critical. And we're going to have a big focus on how do we get to parity in power. Well, that certainly is the hope, and we do. Uh, I, I certainly hope that we move forward on that front. But, you know, speaking about the fragmented world, and, and, and that's the cautionary sort of warning that the WEF has held out as well, which has now been reiterated by the IMF as well mm -hmm. this morning. What is that going to mean uh, in terms of flows, in terms of trade and investment, as we see more protectionism, as, as we see more insularity coming in? that economic globalization has helped lift a billion people out of poverty in the last 30 years. A pullback of that globalization is going to do long-term damage to the prospects of increasing everybody's living standards. So it's important that we come back to a kind of cooperation, we come back to flows of trade, of ideas, of technology, of people um, around the world. And yet at the same time, we also cannot quite go back to the globalization of the past. Mm. There are lessons learned about the damage that was done to specific communities, specific areas of the economy that lost out. But I think it can be done in a way that still leads to overall resilience in economies and societies rather than further shocks because governments have learned how to provide support to specifically disrupted communities or sectors. Um, businesses have learned how to do this in a way that's quite different than what they were doing in the past. Overall standards in the workforce have improved around the world. This need not be any more about simply wage arbitrage in the way that it's been done in the past. This can really be about competition and globalization with a very solid base of skills and human capital. So it can be done in the right way. But that's part of what needs to be discussed here in Davos as well. And it's going to be a journey. It's not something that's going mm. to change overnight because leaders need to come out of this very short-term, insular, inward-looking, crisis-driven mm. mindset that they've been in, understandably, given the shocks that have been happening. But now it's time to start looking again at the medium term and start looking at cooperation. Mm -hmm. So what is the medium term imperative going to be then, Sadia? I mean, how do we move uh, forward down this road? How do we start this journey as we look at this new era of globalization? So the way we look at it is the markets of tomorrow. There are a lot of basic technologies that exist already that if they're applied to agriculture, in places like India, in places like Brazil, in many large emerging markets, technologies that are applied to agriculture, to education, to energy, to food production, to digital trade, to health and to care, to basic core sectors that matter for our societies, that matter for the planet. Applying those existing technologies, spending a little bit of time in investing in the right way, creating the right kinds of policy incentives so more private sector capital goes that way, that's where the focus needs to be. It need not be incredibly sophisticated technologies that do not exist yet. This is not only about mm. further research and development. This is about converting existing technologies into actual well-functioning markets. That's where the hope lies for the future of the global economy. Uh, yeah.